Hello and welcome to my ninth CPD Coffee Time with me, Dr. Tina Ray. Uh, today we're going to focus on using solution-focused brief therapy tools and strategies with children and young people. Um, this is something um, that's been in my toolbox for working with children and young people since late 80s, I think. So I've been using this um, approach for many, many years and it's still something that I find um, permeates what I do actually in my interactions with children and young people. So I, I do um, know that this is really something that should be very useful to many of us still in terms of our practice um, in supporting children's well-being and mental health. If you've been listening to these sessions as we've worked through them regularly, um, you'll know my background. I'm just um, going to briefly summarise this for people who possibly don't know me so well. I was originally a teacher and I've been working as a psychologist since the year 2000. I'm also a prolific author um, and currently work for um, a fostering agency supporting psychologists and um, attachment workers. So very varied and long career but um, I'm also very very passionate remain very passionate about producing resources that are evidence-based very practical and user-friendly for practitioners on the front line in schools and social care so you'll find many of my publications with the charity Nurture UK I'm very proud to have a long association with them and you'll also find many of my publications with Hinton House so the wonderful Sarah Miles who's my publisher of choice, wonderful, empathic um, and really, really authentic person. So I love working with her. So um, you'll find lots of reference to um, some of these publications throughout this session. I use the solution focused approaches in Bouncing Back, Positive Thinking and the ASD Girls Wellbeing Toolkit. So many of these tools you will find in those particular programmes. The aims of the session today are to share the background information regarding solution focus approaches, so where this comes from, how it was first developed, introducing you to some key solution focus techniques that I think are very easy and straightforward to use and apply with children and young people. And I need to say at the outset, you do not need to be a therapist to use these tools. Um, I think in education, this is why these tools have been used so widely and they're so powerful. Um, they are um, very, very user friendly and they just make common sense to me. They are common sense approaches. So we're going to have a go at practicing, hopefully, some of those key techniques. So if you're doing this on your own, you may have to do this after the session. But hopefully, if some of you are able to access this as a smaller group as part of your ongoing CPD, you'll be able to pair up and actually have a go at using some of the techniques with each other. We're also going to take a wee bit of time to consider how you apply some of these approaches in the classroom and, and in one to one situations with children and young people. So what I really want at the end of this is for you to think um, that you know a bit more about the approach, but also that you can actually go away and use and apply these tools in your practice tomorrow. So solution focused brief therapy, in essence, focuses on what we want to achieve, what it is that we want to improve or make better about our lives. It doesn't focus on the problem. It's not problem focused and it doesn't focus on the past. So unlike traditional, some traditional psychological therapeutic approaches, it's, it's not about looking back at your past and analysing that and processing it. It's actually about what we are doing now in this present context and how we want to actually achieve a better future for ourselves. So it's really, really focusing on solutions to those difficulties as opposed to focusing on the problems themselves. So what the therapist or what the practitioner would do in, in terms of supporting an individual is to really encourage them to imagine their future as they really want it to be. So we're going to do an exercise later in the session around um, your ideal future, your ideal day. But it's about thinking about what it is that I would like to achieve and work together so that we can actually identify the specific steps that need to be taken to achieve that goal. So it's about exploring and reviewing that vision and identifying practically what skills, resources and abilities you will need to develop in order to achieve that desired outcome. That's it in a nutshell.
And the assumptions of solution-focused brief therapy that underpin it are as follows. Participants basically confine their own solutions to problems. So very often you'll hear people saying things like, oh, the solutions within yourself, you'll find it, you, you do know what to do, it's there somewhere. Okay, details of the participants past and problem areas are not actually necessary in this process. Also, a key assumption is that there are times when the problem occurs less often. So there are exceptions. So even when we think we have this problem and it happens all the time, there are times when it's not quite so bad. And that's part of the process is really to identify those exceptions and those times when things aren't quite so bad. There is an equal relationship between the client and the professional in this process. So um, and this is really, really important. It's, it's a, a, a mutual relationship where there is not this power imbalance because it's not about the therapist or the professional actually telling the individual what to do. It's about them jointly working together to identify the solutions that the client themselves really already has within themselves. Also, a key assumption is that small changes can lead to bigger ones. Sometimes it doesn't have to be a huge change. It can be something pretty minimal that then leads us on to the next step of change and the next step of change. So solution focused brief therapy approach assumes that all of our children and young people will have some knowledge of what would make their life better. I think this is absolutely true. And they already possess at least the minimal skills necessary to create the solutions they need. So key elements of this approach is that we work with the person, not the problem. We look for resources, strengths, strategies, techniques. We look for the resources within that person, not the deficits, not what is wrong with me. We explore possible and preferred futures, what I would like it to be like, how I would like this to be different. We then explore what is already contributing to these preferred futures, okay? What, what those minimal changes are, what, what are the things that are working, that are exceptions. And we treat people as experts in all aspects of their lives. And this is what I really like. Very often I'm working with kids and I'm being curious about them and what's, what's making them tick. Um, I really want to encourage them to see themselves as the expert. They know themselves better than I know them. They just need that pulling out, okay? So a wee bit of background here. Solution focused brief therapy originally um, developed in the 1980s by Steve DeShazer and in Sue Kimberg. The focus being on solution behaviour, not problem behaviour. Very, very powerful set of tools. And to some extent, it, it did evolve out of this dissatisfaction that many um, therapists, psychologists felt with conventional therapies, which dwelt on the problems and often took place over a considerable amount of time. Um, and in terms of being cost effective, obviously um, not so. I mean, if you're going to engage in that therapeutic relationship for a long, long time, then obviously there are cost implications. Now, for some of us at, at one end of the continuum, that may well be appropriate. But for many of our children and young people, this approach is really, really powerful and useful because actually it can be delivered over a relatively short space of time. And it's also something that as we get it into our narratives, into the way that we speak and interact with children and young people, we will find ourselves using solution focused key tools and strategies just naturally as part of our normal everyday conversations and narratives. Solution focused brief therapy focuses instead on setting goals, identifying exceptions, as I said earlier, to problem situations and using that client or young person's resources in order to reach goals. It drew on systems theory in that it acknowledges that small changes in the system can have a knock on effect on the whole system. So sometimes some of the tiny things that we change about what we're doing, but also within, say, a classroom setting for a child can have a really powerful and positive knock on effect. So for one, solution focused approaches um, really, really important. The principle is that nobody is perfect all the time, even in their problems. We can all find exceptions and we can identify what these tell us. So sometimes when I'm working with a child and we're saying, you know, it's so awful, this always happens to me, I will be asking them, well, when is it not quite so bad? Tell me about the times when, OK, it's not perfect, but it's not quite so bad. What's different then? What's happening? Because what we want to do is try and generate more of those exceptions on a daily basis. Things that we ordinarily do can contribute to a solution. Second principle. 
Knowing where you really want to be often makes getting there easier. If I can visualise my preferred future, where I would like to be, what I'd like my life to be like, then of course I can see it and I can begin to step by step plan out how I'm going to achieve that. And sometimes if we're just focused on the problems and they can cloud our view of the future and we can lose sight of what we want apart from that problem simply vanishing or going away. So the clearer it becomes, the clearer that my end point becomes, the greater chance I have of actually finding the solutions and making them work for me. So this kind of approach, solution focused brief therapy, uses what we would call respectful curiosity and it is respectful. It requires that individual, the child, young person or the adult to see their preferred future and begin the steps to change with small increments. But it's about being curious in a respectful way that supports that whole process so someone can feel safe and secure and nurtured. So how brief is a therapy? Usually in most traditional models of solution focused brief therapy that the therapist will aim for approximately five sessions. So they're usually about 45 minutes. Rarely do they go beyond eight and sometimes one session can be enough. And I would say that in a school context, sometimes one solution, solution focused conversation I have with a young person, it may only last for 20 minutes, can have a real difference and begin to make the change. Um, usually what you do if you're going to do longer sessions over, sorry, more sessions over a longer period of time, you will increase the gap between the sessions as time goes on. So in essence, there's this notion that solution focused brief therapy enables us to shift conversational pathways. So from seeing the person as a problem to the person is more than the problem. From looking at deficits to looking at resources. From complaint to this preferred future, from what is wrong to what is right, from feeling stuck to feeling the capacity and ability to be able to move forwards, from being resistant to making a change or acknowledging a difficulty to engaging in a partnership which is supportive and empathic, from feeling hopelessness or despair to, to actually engaging with this whole expectation of change and the possibility of change. So I'm just going to take some time now to think about the importance of listening skills, because I think that this is absolutely crucial for any um, therapeutic relationship or any form of therapy, whether you're using CBT, solution focus, whatever it is, you need to actually ensure that your listening skills are really honed. And I think they're important in any career, whatever that is, whether it's education, social work, whatever we're doing um, in the workplace, we need to have developed these skills. And children need to focus on learning them as very early as nursery school. This needs to be something that is part and parcel of the curriculum in terms of our emotional literacy wellbeing curriculum. If we are able to listen effectively, we not only gain knowledge, we learn new things, we get better in terms of actually engaging in examination assessment processes. We will even have more friends. And I think this is really important. It builds good relationships, being able to listen and nurture others is essential in developing those positive relationships. Listening has three parts to it. You hear the speaker, you understand what they're saying, and you make a judgment based on that understanding. What is crucial in the listening process is that we actually learn how to develop what I would call active listening, because this also includes concentration. You're focusing on a speaker's eyes while you're processing inflection and body language. And when you are actively listening, you are patient. You're not jumping in, cutting off the speaker. You are actually listening in a way that you really want to engage, really want to understand where they're coming from. And I think it's really important because otherwise, if we don't engage in active listening, we miss out on the right, on the right cues and we miss out on developing those positive relationships. Active listening is being non-judgmental. So we are listening, we are not judging as we listen. And we are not attempting also to jump in and try and solve the problem or the issue for someone. And this is crucial for solution focused brief therapy work. It's about being attentive and respectful to that person who's talking to us. So we're listening closely. We may paraphrase back just to clarify. Did I hear that right? Is this what you're saying, etc. 
And it's not planning what your response is to that person. And it's also not actually switching off or zoning out or daydreaming when they're talking. It's not solving their problems or giving advice. It's listening, it's coming back, it's paraphrasing, it's clarifying. In terms of reinforcing this, I thought it would be quite interesting and a wee bit different just to now look at seven active listening techniques that are used by hostage negotiators. And I think this is really, really important to um, highlight and maybe something that you can reflect on a wee bit more after the session. Think about this particularly with someone maybe over the phone. OK, so you're having that conversation. Um, and I think this is really, really important, this notion of minimal encouragement. So these are the sounds that are made just to let the other person know that you're there and you really are listening to them. So you'll, you'll hear things such as, oh, when, really? They're comments, questions or sounds that don't actually interfere with the flow of the conversation. But what they're doing is they're letting that individual know that, yeah, you're being attentive. Um, and this is the same when we're working with children, and young people. I, I often find myself saying, uh huh, OK, mm, yeah, really? Oh, oh, because what that does is it helps build the rapport and it encourages the, the young person to continue talking to you. Another key active listening skill that um, these hostage negotiators would be using is that of paraphrasing. As I said earlier, this is key to active listening. And this is about giving a wee summary in your own words of what you were just told. And what that shows, if you can do that, is that you've been listening. It creates empathy and establishes rapport because, rapport, because it, it makes it very, very clear to that individual that you've really, truly been listening to what they've been saying. So usually you'll, you'll begin with words such as, um, are you telling me, is this what you're saying? Um, have I got that right? Is, is a question I am always asking children, young people. I want to check it out. That's respectful, but I want to make sure that I haven't jumped to conclusion, um, conclusions. And it also tends to make the subject a better listener. Interestingly, emotional emotion labelling is very often the first active listening skill to be used in a crisis communication in incident. So it's important, obviously, to be attuned to the emotion behind the, the um, words and the facts. So what that person is saying, what is it that they're feeling underneath all of this? Because the, the, the problem for most of us is that we want to just jump in relatively quickly and try and solve the problem. And really, we can't do that because that subject is generally not ready to reason until you've listened enough for long enough to get all the information you need in order to assist them in that problem solving or moving forwards. So very often you, you will you will say things like, mm, you sound, mm, you seem to be, oh, I'm, I'm hearing this. What am I hearing here? Um, and it's about emotion heard by you. And again, empathy is key here. So you don't tell people how they're feeling ever. And this is really, really important when working with young people. It's a total turn off. They, they will actually feel very uncomfortable with that. What you're doing is you're making sure that you sound as if you know what they are feeling. Mirroring or reflecting is also um, a central technique. And this is where you are repeating the last word or phrase and putting a question mark after it. And what that does is it provides a really exact response because you're using that individual's own words. So if the child is saying something to you about how they felt so upset when they, they didn't, they weren't able to cope maybe with that mass task, you say, oh, you weren't able to cope with the mass task. Mm, you felt upset. You're actually just mirroring back to them without guiding the direction of their thoughts. So you're making sure that you have enough to then ask a really pertinent question. And sometimes as well, if the young person in particular has got a bit stuck and doesn't really know what to say, they've, they've kind of lost their words for a wee bit. What that does is it gives them time to process and think whilst you mirror that back to them. Open ended questions also are essential elements of active listening. And what this is really is to try and support that individual young person or, or the adult to start talking. And it actually encourages people to say more without really directing the conversation. Um, so these are the questions that you can't answer with a single word like yes or no, basically. Um, information um, that you get from open ended questions will be much richer. And they'll usually begin with how, what, where, when. 
Um, but why questions are not asked directly? Because they tend to steer the conversation towards blame and they shut down communication. So if we're asking why, like, why did you do that? What that does is it tends to give this idea that you're passing judgment in some way. So be very, very careful about that in interactions therapeutically and just on a daily basis, I think, with kids. Um, Closed end questions give a feeling of interrogation that makes the rapport building really quite difficult. So really be careful about that. And hostage negotiators as well will make frequent use of I messages because what this allows them to do is lets the subject, lets the other individual know how he's, he or she is making you feel, why you feel like that and, wh and what the subject can do to remedy it. So it's, it's a non-threatening approach. And I messages are used when communication is difficult because of the intense emotions that may be being directed at you. So it's also used when the subject is trying to manipulate you and you don't you want him or her to stop the any attempt. So it's very, very powerful in hostage negotiations. But I also I think in terms of working with children, young people as well. And effective pauses are, are also really quite important. We mustn't be frightened of silence. Obviously, for the hostage negotiators, this can be really powerful because um, very often people are not comfortable with silence. They'll try to fill it and, and they will um, also um, possibly communicate more information than they possibly wanted to. But sometimes as well, it allows that space just to um, let something be thought about and processed in, in a deeper way. And some other tips, just general tips in order to, I think, build our skills in terms of actually working with young children and, and young people effectively and developing this, this communication with them. Compliments are really important, but they have to be authentic. Mark Twain said, I can live for two months on a good compliment, but they've got to be realistic. Otherwise, um, you're not going to take them seriously. Certainly young people don't. Inauthentic praise, as we, we learned before from Carol Dweck, you know, is, is, is not particularly helpful at all. In fact, we, we must be engaging with process praise. So really important. It's amazing what people overcome or the resources they draw on to solve problems. And these are the things that we can flag up and compliment. So I can see that must have been really difficult time for you. My goodness, you've come through that. You're, you're here. You're, you've got into school. Um, even though things have been really difficult. So th there must be some real strengths here that you're using. What, what, how have you managed to do that? I'm curious about that. So really, really important that we actually complement in this in this way. And two other tips for building effective communication. Uh, using reflective statements with a positive twist can also be useful. So as I said earlier, you, you know, you found it pretty tough so far and you haven't found a way forward yet. That lovely word yet. I love it. Basically, we're, we're not there yet, but we could be there. You know, that that actually presupposes that, you know, you've got some real strengths in there that are going to be able to use. We're going to use them. You're going to use them in order to get to be where you want to be. So opening up that possibility of really positive change and the way forward. Presuppositions are also helpful. So how did you manage to change things for the better? This presupposes that the young person or child or client has changed things and that they have the resources to effect these changes and see them through. Also, this is a lovely one. I don't know whether you'll find a solution today or in the next few days. What this presupposes is that the client will eventually find a solution. So very useful tips, I think. So in the traditional model, um, the first session usually with the, with the client or the young person and the SFBT worker would be to actually engage to identify your best hopes of our work together. What is it that you want? What, what were your best hopes for actually this relationship that we're going to be building? Then also we would use the miracle question. So I'm um, going to go into this in much more detail, but this is about um, finding out where, what the preferred future is. It's a technique for doing that. And we're going to have a go at doing this um, as we go through this session. Then finding exceptions. So telling me about when the problem is not there, what they're already doing that's successful. And what would others notice about you if this problem wasn't there? Key question, what might change by asking a small step towards hopes? So the preferred future, as I said earlier, absolutely essential. Identifying times in their current life that are close to this. So when is it nearest to that? When is it nearly as good as it could be? So focusing on what is different, the exceptions, 
What is it about that situation? And actually bringing those small differences and successes to that client's awareness, because very often if we're focusing just on the problem, we don't actually highlight for ourselves the times when maybe it's not quite so bad. So again, this helps the individual, the child, the client, the young person to repeat successful things in the future that preferred future to happen and to become a reality. We will explore that with the person. We'll explore the when, where, with whom, how bits of it and how it's already happening. And we'll also identify practical and user friendly ways that they can move forward. And this is important for young people. They can do this. There's no theory beyond social constructivism here. So, again, I'm reinforcing the fact you do not need to be a therapist to use these tools. OK, we just need to stick to the principles. So the key resources and tools that we would be using in our interactions, in the support sessions that we would develop, the SFBT sessions we might develop with that young person, we would use the miracle question, we would use scaling, exception seeking questions, coping questions and problem free talk. Let's go through each of these now. So the miracle question, this is identifying how the future may be. It helps to establish goals and we ask it slowly. We're paying attention to nonverbal cues, being very sensitive to that and taking our time, using our active listening skills and giving the young person time to answer and ignoring don't knows, just actually keeping the encouragement going so that that person feels able to keep focusing on this particular question and their answer to it. This is how I would sometimes phrase the miracle question. I'd say something like, I'm going to ask you a very strange question, but don't get worried. It's this. When we finish talking, you're going to go back to your class, your home, whatever you need to do for the rest of the day. You're going to get on with it, doing homework, etc, etc. You'll go to bed and then what happens is that everyone else in your house is quiet and relaxed and you're asleep. But in the middle of the night, a miracle happens. And the problem that's brought you here today to talk to me is solved. It's gone. It's just vanished. So you don't have any way of knowing it was solved because a miracle happened when you were asleep. So when you get up tomorrow morning, what might be the small change that will make you say to yourself, something must have happened overnight. The problem's gone. Children, young people generally will be able to answer this and with the right encouragement and support and the proper um, active listening skills on our part, we'll be able to identify it. So what is it different? What's different that next day? And very often I'll say to them, can you describe me your miracle day from the moment you get up the next day? What's the first thing that happens? And they might say something like, well, um, I go downstairs, I have my breakfast, my mum's really happy, she's not angry with me, I go to school, the teachers smile at me, I get on with my work, I'm really popular in the playground, my friends play with me, we have a great time, I go home, all my homework's really easy, I get it all done, etc, etc. But then go back and say, well, how is that different to your normal day? And we will then identify all the differences. But what we're doing there is saying, you know, what is it about this day that is different to your normal day? So this is how we actually then elicit the information about how that child wants to see their future, how they want their preferred future to look. What we would then do after asking the miracle question and identifying the differences is to say, OK, let's think about this on a scale of 0 to 10. It's usually 0 to 10. And this is an enabling them to identify resources. So I might say to them, OK, so where do you think you are on that scale in terms of this difficulty at the moment? And, and you know, where do you think you are? And they might say, well, I'm on a kind of four, maybe a three or four because, you know, this isn't so good or that's not so good. I'm not happy about that. And then I would say to them, well, what would you need to do to improve things by one point or where would you like to be on the scale? And then I would be asking, well, how can you get there? OK, what is it that you need to actually do differently or, or who can help you? How can we help you? Because then that enables us to identify the resources. So they might say, well, do you know, I'd like to be on an eight or nine. I don't think most people are on a 10, you know, because there's no such thing as perfection. Someone might say that. But they would say, you know, I want to be a bit higher and, and this would need to be different. So then we're going to be thinking about how we can get there. 
so I might engage then in some coping questions because sometimes these really help to identify resources that the young person or the client might not even acknowledge or know that they have. And this can be used even in the most pessimistic situations where a child is saying, oh, I'm on minus 24 or minus 600. You know, I think this is really, really important. It's just those coping questions, being curious, as I said earlier, this is really quite powerful and recognising resources. And this helps to support the child or young person to actually identify that preferred future. Uh, it doesn't mean also it, it doesn't um, enable or allow the child to, to perceive you as contradicting them in any way. So I would say, you know, despite all the problems, you're still working, you're still coming into school. How do you do it? That's if we, we are kind of really getting a bit stuck. And problem free talk again, this is really, really helpful. And very often I'll start the session with this, to be honest, um, just thinking about, you know, things about, you know, the world outside, what's been going on, politics, the weather, anything to do with what that's not to do with the problem, basically. And then any kind of probes around leisure, friends, relaxing, conflict resolution actually can begin to help us identify some of the strengths and resources to move forward. So, you know, you describe you're successful um, at work dealing with conflicts. Could the skills be used at home with your child? You, you've, you've actually said that you have a really, really good relationship with your younger sister. Do you think you could kind of bring that into some of your relationships with your peers at school, etc.? So problem free talk. So this is my personal framework for um, running a session. So I would start with problem free talk. We define what the problem is, where that, you know, what, what's your best hope for these sessions with me? Where, where do you want to go? What do you think the issue is? Because very often it's not what the adults think the issue is for a young person. They, they have their own idea. We then do the goal setting, preferred future, using the miracle question. We might do some exception findings. We would definitely do some scaling where you want to be with this in the future, where you are now. And we locate resources. So building on strengths, who's going to help you? How are they going to do this? So making then an action plan and then finishing. So again, to reinforce this possible structure for the first session or the first interaction, problem free talk, talking about anything other than the individual's life, actually, apart from the problem or anything within the child's life apart from the problem. What are your best hopes to get from this? OK, exceptions to the difficulties, my preferred future or the miracle question. And what would life be like without the problem? So just to reinforce that. So now is your opportunity to actually have a go at practicing these key tools. Um, and I know that, you know, some people may be using this as an individual CPD session because that's how you fit it in. For others of you, I'm hoping because I am hearing on the grapevine that, that people are in schools being able to access um, these sessions in smaller groups. So quite possibly this might be something that you could do in pairs together. So I'm hoping that people will be able to do that because you do need to um, pair up for these activities. But I'm going to take you through each of these particular tools and hopefully you can have a go and have some time to think about it afterwards, talk about it with each other, and reflect on it and think about how you would apply these or um, with children and young people that you support and nurture. Because I think developing this repertoire of key tools and techniques is going to be really helpful to all of us going forwards in terms of actually engaging with children, particularly as we begin gradually to make this um, transition back into schools after this um, prolonged lockdown. So problem free talk, just take 10 minutes or so to have a go at just talking about nothing other than lovely things, positive things, um, without dwelling on any kind of problems, but just actually getting your active listening skills going with each other. So really being careful to establish what I would call a good rapport. Ask the person if you're going to be the the the, the um, therapist stroke. I, I put that in quotation marks. If, if you're going to be the person leading the session, Ask them to tell you about something that's been going well for them recently or they've been particularly pleased with something that they've enjoyed, something that they've been pleased with, a nice experience. If they can't think of anything recently, ask them to talk about something in the past that made them happy, that they felt very um, pleased with. 
um, and then try and look for any competency, skills, coping strategies, qualities, strengths, etc. that they reveal. So if someone's talking about something that they did, for example, in their work, when they were really pleased with the way in which a child interacted with them and they got them to make some progress, try and identify some of the skills and competencies and coping strategies, etc. that they revealed in that process. And then see if you can paraphrase, summarize, summarize basically what they've told you and feed it back to them. OK, so then if you can manage to do this within the time, swap over and repeat. So if you can maybe do sort of five minutes per person and actually have the chance to swap over and repeat. So you both get a chance at engaging in problem free talk and paraphrasing back to the individual. Activity two, again, impairs preferred future or setting goals. And it's really important now to focus on how things will be when the situation has improved or the problem is solved. So ask each other to identify something that you might like to change. It doesn't have to be too big or deep. This is a CPD session, so it might be something relatively small. But ask them a number of questions as appropriate to try and elicit their preferred future. What would you like it to be like? Let's try and draw them out. And ask some questions such as, can you describe how things will be when the problem's been solved, when it's not there, when the magic wand's been waved? What are your best hopes for us actually engaging in this together? What would you like to get from this? If this session is helpful, how would you know? What will other people like your friends or family notice about you if our session's been successful? You could try the miracle question, and I think it might be a useful thing to do. I, I would actually really have a go at, at doing this because that helps to support the development of a more meaningful and tangible vision of the preferred future. So I've given you a wee script here um, that you could use with each other. OK, so trying to get as much detail as possible on what life would look like without the problem once the miracle has happened. OK, so both of you have a go and then swap over roles. Activity three is problem definition, and this is really important element of the SFBT approach because it's about separating the person from the problem. Getting them to step back and describe it in really concrete ways is a really powerful way of doing this because sometimes the, the problem can seem far too big to overcome. So you'll hear people saying things like, oh, it's too awful. Oh, it's the worst class I've ever taught. I've never had such a bad class. He's just awful all of the time, that kid. You know, I don't think I'll ever be able to get through it and cope with this on a daily basis. Um, what we need to do in these interactions is try and get the individual who seems to be presenting this as a huge problem into being able to divide it down into much more manageable chunks, so much smaller, easier chunks that they can actually begin to work through step by step. So when you're working with your partners on this one, try and get each other to tell um, you about a problem that's not too heavy or too serious. So keep it quite lighthearted. It might even be trivial for, for this um, purpose today. So ask each other. You've got to identify a problem, but nothing too heavy or too serious. And then try and elicit factual information. So. Who else is there when this happens? Where, when does it happen? Does it happen all the time or just occasionally? Are there exceptions here? Trying to separate the person from the problem and also looking for strengths and resources that might um, emerge. So both of you in your pairs have a go at this swap over and, to, and take some time to reflect on how this went and how easy it was um, to engage in problem definition processes. Activity four, using exceptions. So this is again an important part of this um, brief therapy approach because it helps to develop and foster competencies and resources again. So try out some questions with your partner around a problem situation. Again, you might use the previous problem that you've identified. You might have the same problem throughout all of this, um, these tasks, actually. It's, it's up to you guys. So just tell me about a time when it doesn't happen. When does it happen less? When does it bother you the least? When have you been able to avoid or resist the urge to? What was life like before, etc.? So maybe using some of those prompt questions will help you in this process. OK, activity five is rating scales. And I, I've briefly gone through these already. But in, in this activity, work with each other to describe on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being the worst that it could be, where you are at, the, at this moment in time with your particular problem or difficulty. And you could then usually ask, what you'd usually ask is, so what is it that you're doing or have been doing so that it's not less than that? 
where would you like to be is the next question. So this could be a 10, but 10 is sometimes very unrealistic. Remember, it's, it kind of signifies perfection, which is basically impossible. But ask them, you know, where would you like to be? It could possibly be six, seven, eight. What would life be like? What would be different if you could have reached that point? So tell me what you're already doing to help you um, get to three now, be at three now, and then what would you need to, to do differently? Or what resources would you need in order to get to four, five, etc.? So this really helps then support the process of really identifying more short term goals. So this has been a whistle stop tour and I'm very well aware of that, but I, I really wanted to just flag up some of the key tools and strategies. And I would suggest that you, you take this away. You have some more thinking time around it and, and kind of liaise with each other a wee bit more, because there, there could be lots of things that you could take from this in terms of developing your interactions with children, young people and, and actually trying to make them more solution focused just in everyday conversations. It doesn't necessarily this have to be something that's part of a therapeutic intervention at all. Um, what I really love to see in schools is when people are actually being solution focused just in their normal everyday um, interactions in the classroom context. So think about one thing that you will change possibly about your practice and the ways in which you support children and young people as a result of listening to this wee CPD coffee time today. What strategy could you possibly try out now and with whom? It might even be as simple as identifying a child that you're going to help to be more solution focused by finding exceptions and encouraging them to do that when you challenge their negative automatic thinking. Think about why you would do that and then also take some time to share it with your group, a partner or colleagues later. If you're doing this on your own, obviously this is something that you can do at a later time, but you can actually begin just to reflect on this for yourself now. And a useful key resource that I would really recommend to you is the Hinton House Essential Guide to Solution Focused Brief Therapy. Um, with children and young people. Basically, this resource will give you all the resources I think that you would need to take this forward for working with younger children and teenagers and using these key tools and strategies effectively and with confidence. But, you know, it's, it's about actually just doing that wee bit more work, wee bit more um, research and investigation into the, this way of working. And I, I would thoroughly recommend it. Very user friendly. And also, of course, as ever, I'm just flagging up the wellbeing toolkit for mental health leads because clearly in many of the sessions in this um, 20 session comprehensive CPD um, toolkit, we have made use of a range of these um, tools and strategies in many of the sessions, particularly those which are introducing therapeutic tools and approaches such as motivational interviewing and CBT. So thank you again for listening. Um, I hope that this has been a helpful session for you and I look forward to developing and presenting the next one in this series. I'm going to keep them going for um, the duration, I think, of this, certainly this term, because I'm well aware that um, it's very difficult at this current time to navigate and, and um, get hold of good CPD. And also there are issues around cost effectiveness in schools, given the constraints of budgets, etc. So um, I'm also clearly passionate about ensuring that our wonderful teachers, practitioners out there on the ground, working with children, and young people throughout this pandemic do um, feel supported and do feel valued. And there are so many of us out there who are extremely grateful to the jobs that you do and what you do with our children and young people and hopefully this is one way in which I as a psychologist can give a wee bit back so thanks for listening and hopefully you'll join me next time